Hemwa's Girl has also asked her subscribers about intelligence. This is another interesting ponderable I find, since there is intelligence, reason, and wisdom, and the, th and the three seem to overlap. I once came across the joke that as one's level of education, or scholarship, climbs, it tends to specialize, and one learns more and more about less and less, and one is finally an expert when one knows everything about nothing. I'm inclined to define intelligence as the ability to learn. Since one can't learn something without first recognizing and admitting that one does not already know it, all intelligence I'm compelled to conclude begins with the agnostic recognition. The ability to learn depends on one's willingness to admit it when one doesn't know something. Socrates was recognized by his friends as a wise man because he had the wisdom to recognize himself as a fool. But is this more wisdom, reason, or intelligence? Clearly, this recognition is in the overlap. There's also the saying, the more I learn, the less I know. The basis for this particular conclusion, it seems to me, is the observation that the more one learns, the better the understanding one has of just how limited one's understanding of the world is. That's not necessarily a bad thing, though. That may seem deflating, but one, but one who has all the answers has nothing left to discover. Thus, the better one understands just how limited one's understanding of the world is, the better one understands and appreciates just how many discoveries are waiting to be made. Sometimes, highly knowledgeable people have a reputation for being overbearing. After all, as one learns more and more, and subsequently comes to appreciate better and better just how limited one's understanding of the world is, one also comes to realize just how limited everyone else's understanding is, and one feels compelled to illustrate this point to them. Many people are very quick to allege that science is perhaps not the best source for answers, given the degree of uncertainty reflected in its language. Many a scientist, after all, uses phrases like, it would seem, and we are led to conclude, at times when the pseudoscientist would say, we know. This, however, is actually science's greatest strength, and pseudoscience's greatest weakness. Science is not about claiming to have every answer. It is about following the evidence wherever it leads, especially the new evidence. It is about seeking new answers every day. Every answer science has ever furnished us is an answer that the human race spent most of our history without. Science depends on recognizing it and admitting it when one does not have the answer to a certain question, because one must recognize that one lacks this answer before one can find it. Such recognition is necessary in order to leave the door open for discovery. Thus, the conclusions of science are always inductive instead of deductive. That is, they are tentative, subject to revision in the event of the introduction of additional pieces of evidence, and necessarily so, in order for science to be a self-correcting process. In order to continuously expand the limits of human understanding, one must recognize those limits. In order to continuously iron out the errors of human understanding, one must be ever vigilant in one's effort to find those errors, which is not possible if one denies them. The degree of uncertainty in the conclusions of science reflected in the average scientist's choice of words is necessary to that end. So when the pseudoscientist asserts his or her conclusions with very confident language, this conveys less about the foundation for those conclusions and more about the arrogance of the pseudoscientist. This is a way of denying being a fool, the act of which utterly precludes wisdom. Ah, but wait, I have sort of strayed from the subject. The subject is intelligence, which I define as the ability to learn. The agnostic recognition, or the Socratic recognition, is only one component of this. There is also an inquisitive nature, which is a big help as well. One tends to have a far easier time learning from what one reads when one keeps an eye out for questions raised by it. Questions which, if it's written properly, are answered shortly thereafter, if they can be. This is why Carl Sagan lamented the tendency some parents have to squelch any inquisitive streak their children may exhibit. Here's an example question. Dad, why is the moon round? Here's a bad response. What would you expect it to be, square? Here's another bad response. Oh, uh, God just made it that way. Just because he likes moons to be round. He's mysterious that way. Here's a good response. Gravity. You see, the more mass something has, the more gravity it has, which means the less things can protrude from it before being pulled back in by the force of their own weight. Indeed, if you look close enough with a telescope, for, for example, you can see that it's not quite round. It has mountains and valleys and craters, but of course we can't see those with just the unaided eye. Here's another good response if you don't happen to know that. You know, that's a good question. I don't know, but maybe someday you'll find out. Indeed, world-renowned astronomer Neil deGrasse Tyson was once asked by a concerned parent what can I do to foster in my children an interest in science? His answer was, get out of their way. I'm paraphrasing here, but basically he explained that science is all about seeking answers, rationally, but inquisitively. Given the fact that children are naturally inquisitive, since they naturally ask questions in search of answers, work with that. Accommodate that. I recently began a study of business, economics, and finance. I would hardly want to make a living in any of these fields, but we all have a vested interest in learning a few things about them. Previous attempts, though, 
have been far more frustrating than learning about things like science, and I have a suspicion about why that is, an especially cynical suspicion. You see, scientists enjoy teaching their trade, and they have a vested interest in doing so. The more the members of any given society understand about science, what it's for and how it works, the more they tend to appreciate it, which means the more they tend to support things like government funding of scientific research, which means the more they tend to elect officials who support such things, which means the more such research tends to be funded. This fosters more and greater advancement in science, which means that the society in question has more of a tendency to reap the benefits of that science, benefits like filter tap water and worldwide high-speed communications. Finance, though, is different. Let me use car repair as a metaphor. Imagine if you go to an auto repair place. The technician asks what the problem is, and you explain that the engine turns over but is having increasing difficulty starting up, so you think one of the spark plugs is due for replacement. With that, you have shown the technician that you know a few things about cars, so if he, or she for all I know, lies to you about the problem and what steps he or she took to correct it, you might very well be able to tell, and next time you might go somewhere else. This technician is going to think, I'd better be honest, or I'd risk, to, or I'd risk losing out on repeat business. What if, on the other hand, when the technician asks what the problem is, you reply that your car has an ache in its tum? Well, you might as well wear a t-shirt bearing the words, Please rip me off, in bright red lettering. If you want to make the most of your chances for getting a fair deal, you have to exhibit some understanding of the subject matter. Such is how it is with finance. The world of finance, because it deals with money, is dominated by those who understand money and financial concepts. Therefore, these people have a, vest a vested interest in doing what they can to distract from the books that actually do a good job of explaining the subject, lest they have to share their dominance of the field. Therefore, I suspect they write books that don't do such a good job, that instead do a better job of making the subject vague and confusing and discouraging in order to send the message to whatever unfortunate soul opens, op op opens one of these books that finance is complicated and you stand no chance of understanding it, so you might as well not even try. Better to just give your money over to the professionals and simply assume that they will handle it in an honest fashion. Then, of course, they decorate the covers of these books in the most eye-catching way and maybe even sponsor publicity efforts just to enhance the distraction. But, of course... Finance is not rocket science. So if you're up to the task of understanding rocket science, you're probably up to the task of understanding finance, if it's explained properly. When you try reading a book on the subject of finance, and you have difficulty understanding it, don't get discouraged. Maybe it's because you don't have the necessary aptitude, but more likely it's because this book is a red herring. Finding books that explain the subject honestly may take a while, but it's worth it. The problem with pseudoscience is that many a pseudoscientist has the same interest when it comes to science. You see, this is the fundamental difference between science and pseudoscience. Science relies on evidence and reason, while pseudoscience relies on ignorance. When a scientist asks you to accept a given conclusion, it's because that conclusion is supported by the evidence. Whereas when a pseudoscientist asks you to accept a given con conclusion, it's because he or she is counting on you not to know certain things. Evolution is still only a theory. This is an argument from someone counting on you not to know that being a theory does not preclude something being a fact, or that in, f in science, theory just means school of thought. Or this argument comes from someone who does not himself know. Evolution can't be true because things don't just pop into existence out of nothing. This is an argument either from someone who doesn't know, or who is counting on you not to know what evolution actually proposes. Darwin predicted that if evolution were true, we should find thousands of transitional forms in the fossil record, and in the century and a half that has elapsed since then, we've never found a single one. This party either doesn't know about the like of Australopithecus afarensis, Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Archosauria, and Archaeopteryx lithographica, or is counting on you not to know. So the pseudoscientist basically has a vested interest in opposing the efforts of the scientists to educate and inform public understanding of such sub subjects as these, because the pseudoscientist profits from public ignorance. But in this particular conflict, the pseudoscientist has at least one unfair advantage. The general public, at least in my country, grows increasingly difficult to educate. That is, dare I say, less intelligent. You see, in order to grasp a complex concept, one must be able to pay attention long enough. This depends on a certain breadth of attention span. Therefore, the shorter one's attention span, the greater the difficulty one has paying attention long enough to grasp a complex concept. Since I'm always trying to gain an understanding of complex concepts, I continuously strive to broaden my attention span. To that end, I have this mental exercise I undergo. It's a kind of meditation. When I started doing this exercise, it was for just five minutes. I found a comfortable place to sit, set the timer for five minutes, closed my eyes, and concentrated on sitting still and keeping, my, and keeping my breathing slow and deep. I did this exercise every day, sometimes more than once in a day, until this started to get easy. Then I increased it to six minutes, and then seven, and little by little I have worked my way up to fifteen. In that time, I have noticed I have gradually less difficulty in doing boring, tedious, monotonous things. Sitting stuck in traffic doesn't bother me as much as it used to, and the time I spend on the elliptical machine at the gym goes by faster. So it seems to me that intelligence, the ability to learn, depends primarily on at least three components. The agnostic Socratic recognition, 
an inquisitive streak, and a broad attention span.